friend and welcome to Broadcast Original Series 2.18 with Amory and Peter. Hello. Covering Kirk's obsession for men. <laughs> yes. But a little bit of business from the last episode. God like being so far. I can't remember who asked the question, but somebody did. Now, it has to be said that some of these are easier to determine as definitely godlike aliens than others. So, for instance, the cage. Well, duh, Telosians. Where no man has gone before is a little hard because it's human beings, but then they get kind of infected and they have godlike powers, don't they? So I don't know if that counts. Remember all the way back to the second pilot? Is that the one where they smashed him over the head with the, when they defeated him with the grave, or is that like Yeah, that, that, there is the big gravestone thing there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Charlie X obviously is a godlike. Yeah. Being of technically the menagerie parts one and two, of course, uses stuff from the cage, so they feature there as well. Squire Gothos, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mini Q. Arena, you've got the Metrons. Yeah. Aaron and Mercy, you've got the Organians. Yeah. <laughs> See it in the Edge of Forever. Well, the Guardians of Forever are pretty powerful, but arguably not godlike, I suppose. I mean, they, they've just got that like, portal so you can travel through time, so that's possibly not godlike, just very, very advanced. So let's not count those. So that's season one. And season two so far, Cat's Paw, we get the or- Ornithoids, but they're powerful with their magic, but they actually turn out to be tiny pipe cleaner aliens, so I'm, I'm not going to count them as godlike, no. No. Uh, who mourns for Adonis, though? We get Fecking Apollo, so definitely that's one. Yeah. And more, most recently, of course, we've got the uh, Triskelion. Yeah. Did I get that right? Yeah. Hey. So the uh, most conservative e- estimate so far, we've got eight godlike aliens. And there are, we've done 48 episodes, including tonight's. So oh, twenty one sixth. Yes, yeah, so 20%. Six eighths of 48, so yeah. one sixth. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, it's, it's a large amount, but not overwhelming, I suppose. Not quite as overwhelming as I kind of got the impression it was. Uh, feel free to disagree with any of those definitions, by the way, and let me know if I've missed one or two out. Uh, the Facebook page is probably the best place to do that. But all feel free to email us. Right, on to tonight's episode, which is written by... Art Wallace, which is such a 1970s name. Uh, First of one and a half by him. What? (laughs) Yeah, he gets a co-writer credit on the next one. Okay. Uh, He also wrote for the Planet of Apes TV series and an episode of Space 1999. And then directed by Ralph Sinensky. Fourth of seven. The last one was Bread and Circuses. He took a a break for a few hours one evening during filming to observe Yon Kippur. And well done for the studio for allowing him. Yeah. Serious producer John Meredith Lucas took over the helm for a bit to cover for him. Ah, that's yeah. good. Nice. Yes. Captain's log, star date 3619.2. With the mysterious death of two crewmen, all personnel on the planet have been evacuated back to the ship. Rizzo, did you feel a presence, an intelligence? <laughs> about it, Bones. It must be destroyed. Fire photon torpedoes. It's still coming, sir. The deflectors will not stop it, Captain. Contact. Captain Ruler. All hatches remain secure. All lights on the board still green. Sir, we have a red light. Something's entered through the number two impulse vent. Sir, the creature's in my cabin. It's got Mr. Spock. Captain, look. It's going to be close. Very, very close. So we're on a planet. Another us crummy planet. The so. usual one. Yeah. And Spock says that what they found is pure tritanium. AKA polystyrene. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it won't break if you hit it. Yes, it will. It's yes. polystyrene. But anyway. Um, so <laughs> it's Spock, bits everywhere. So Spock will phaser off a specimen. And they see smoke. And it breathe. falls. It comes off really badly, doesn't yeah, it? Sort of. <laughs> you see smoke, but then it disappears. Kirk asks what the smell is and says it's a thing. He who smelt it dealt it. Yeah. <laughs> so then he says you've got to scan for dichronium. Dichronium. And fire if they see a gaseous cloud. Target that explosion and fire. Fire! No, that's, not, that's not a good idea. <laughs> no, no, fire and farts don't mix. No. Uh, and then he says it. he last caught that odour 11 years ago. 
they sort of seem to read it and then have lost it as though it knows they're scanning it and it's changing into something different. Two red shirts choke. A third red shirt uses comms to say that it spotted it. This is Ensign Rizzo. Not Rizzo the rat. Well, funny enough, Rizzo is the way it's spelt. Oh. Uh, this is, a, a, I think, might be a curious Shatnerism. I don't know. Uh, he's played by Jerry Ayres, who was last seen as a red shirt dying on Cestus Three due to an attack by the Gorn. And seen no Hurley. And as a result, they so that people don't get fused and think this is the same guy because it's the same actor. They dye his hair orange to try and oh. disguise him. Right. Yes. All for him just to die again. Yeah. So all the red corpuscles have gone from the bodies, so it's sort of vampire-ish. Mm-hmm. It's a medical emergency. They've got to beam him up. It's something that can't exist but does. Mm. Well, no, if it clearly does exist, then your definition of what can't exist needs to be rethought rather than it can't exist. Clearly it does. It's there. I I find that a bit of a weird thing to say. But anyway, that's your teaser. Yes. Yeah. After the teaser, you've got Chapel using some science equipment, which I like. And McCoy has examined the bodies. There's no incisions at all. There's no, you know, it's not like they've bled out, they can't have done. Kirk says that the the Farragut um, lists deaths of the same causes and says, I recommend you look look at the tapes. McCoy says, oh, I will. And uh, says for McCoy to check the, the tapes and then says, bring Ensign Rizzo to consciousness. And he says, you know, do you remember the cold? Did you notice the odour? And he says, yes. But I understand McCoy at this point because what McCoy is saying was he's really suggest- suggestionable. Is that the word? Because he's only semi-conscious and you're going, did you smell it? Did you remember it? Rather than asking a question like, what did you smell? Mm. Do you, it, Leading it, the witness on. Yeah, basically. Right. But interestingly, he says it's like being smothered in honey and trying to draw strength from them. Meanwhile, the rest of the crew are saying, but we need to be rendezvousing with the Yorktown because as is always the case with these things, they got special medical supplies that are going to go off <laughs> i mean you know surely if you've got special medical supplies that are going to go off just don't give them to a ship called enterprise give them to something else and then let the enterprise go and do the other stuff to be fair the the, the medical supplies are on the york town aren't they? they've got to pick them up is that right yeah but yeah. then you've got that as well with like there's at least one next gen episode oh there's several next gen ones like that yeah, yeah. It becomes a bit of a cliche but it's the first time it's happened here so okay f- you can't that's... really criticize it fair enough by the way the, the uss yorktown was Brodenbury's original name for the enterprise okay and it's another world war ii aircraft carrier it'll return in star trek 4 as one of the ships that's taken out by the whale probe yep and originally, Rodenborough suggested that the Enterprise A that we get at the end of Star Trek IV on, which gives Andy so much joy, uh, <laughs> was the Yorktown that was refitted. Oh, OK. Badly, as it turns out, in yeah. Star Trek V. USS Enterprise, Shakedown Cruise Report. I think this new ship was put together by monkeys. Oh, she's got a fine engine, but half the doors won't open. And guess whose job it is to make it right? These are important things because they involve Star Trek V. <sighs> Huh. Huh. And then they're trying to scan for it and they're not getting anywhere. And Kirk is like, but what if it could change shape? What if it could camouflage itself? And Spock looks at Kirk like he's nuts and Mm. goes, what, you mean like lead to gold? But then Kirk says, yes, you've just given me an idea. Go talk to McCoy. Look at the tapes from the Farragut. Then uh, the new security officer is called for the bridge, and I didn't catch his name. At Ensign Garavik. Garavik. Yeah. And his father was in Starfleet, and we find out was the captain of the Farragut at the time of the incident 11 years ago. The character returns in an episode of Prodigy D, uh-huh. apparently. Mm. Mm. So Kirk turns around to Garavik and says, you know, did you know Rizzo? He says, yes, we're at the academy together. And he says, right, well, you're going to get a crack at what killed him. Meanwhile, the the... So they beam down as a five-man team and the reading is changing. They are seeing that molecular shift. So Kirk says, if you see it, fire full phases. And then you find there's two men down, one's dead, one's in sick bay. And Garavik says he didn't exactly freeze, he was startled. So to begin with, we have a smoke effect again. Yeah. Like we did up behind the rocks, so it looked like a member of the crew was having a, a sneaky fag. Um, but then it turns into a, a light effect, and that's very similar to the one they had in Metamorphosis, including the sparkly bits. Mm. So it's a slightly less original, that one. Yeah, I like the smoke. I'm not so much a fan of the sparkly Lighty. bits. Yeah, yeah, it's not as good, is it? No. Anyway, he says he's hesitated, so Kirk relieves him of his duties. And meanwhile, the other senior officers are continuing to question what he's doing and decisions he's making. And he says he's fed up of his, the others conspiring against him. 
and he asks Chekhov, you know, are you scanning for what he asks? And, and Chekhov's like, yes, but there's nothing. And he says, do it again and again and again and again and again. Then Spock appears in medical lab and says to McCoy, I need your advice. To which McCoy's response is, then I need a drink, <laughs> which I like. Mm. And basically Spock explains he doesn't understand obsession. He explains that Garavik was the, the captain of the Farragut and passes McCoy a tape. So there's been like eight or ten hours of tapes. McCoy hasn't had a chance to look through them all. So I'm presuming that Spock has created a summary. Yeah, edited highlights. Yeah. McCoy then visits Kirk in his quarters and it turns out that Kirk also paused before firing and blames himself. This was for 11 years ago. And McCoy says he was um, obsessed and so it starts challenging him and then Kirk's like, oh, you know, don't push our friendship too far. And McCoy's like, no, this isn't about friendship. This is professional. This is me preparing a medical log for which a witness of command level is required, at which point Spock walks in. Yeah, he quotes the regs and reminds the captain the Yorktown is waiting, but Kirk reacts poorly. He talks about scenting intelligence in the smoky light creature when it attacked in the back in the day. Spock asks for something more definite and McCoy delicately points out that Kirk may have imagined it. <laughs> Kirk quotes the regs saying, intuition is a command prerogative, which, well, that could be used to justify anything, couldn't yeah. it? That's not good. Captain does at least recognise that his senior officers are doing their duty and expressing their concerns. So, you know, he's yeah. completely, completely got off the, the deep end here. McCoy says he's willing to give Kirk some time before submitting his log, which may or may not be the right decision, given how irrational Kirk has behaved so far. And then Chekhov hails, having picked up a, a reading on this smoky light creature, revealing it to leaving the planet. We see the smoky thing ahead. Now, of course, the remastered edition, they have to CG it. Whereas in the original version, we get what looks like a smoky creature because it's smoke that they have filmed and therefore is better. They don't make them like they used to, those guys. And I can't get used to the way that it is today. Just leave things alone, you idiots. I, oh, don't, I don't know what the remastered version looks like. Not so as good. Just... It looks like CG smoke, which never looks right. So, oh, okay. you know, or, well, given enough money these days does. But, back but not back then, you know. no. I mean, all I could think, though, when I saw this on the screen was like, that you're chasing a fart through space. Yep. Scotty complains that they're flying the ship apart, pursuing the creature. But he just gets told to go faster until Kirk finally agrees to reducing speed when they start flying apart, basically. This, in a lovely scene, Chapel brings Garavik some food. He's blaming himself and refuses to eat. Chapel brandishes a data chip from McCoy, which she says has one word on it, eat. She's lying, which is a nice bit of character business yeah. for her. You can imagine the Strangely Wills version doing the same thing. Actually. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. Problem is, we don't get enough of these character moments in the original series, which is why the Strange New Worlds incarnation seems out of keeping. It's just because we don't get enough character for Chapel to, you know. But have that's that sort that's of a deliberate point, the same way as you don't with Ahura, and that's mm. why they've they've yeah. tried to develop their characters more. The uh, smoke slows to a halt. Surprisingly, Garavik flings his cloche at the wall. Yeah, very classy, and it knocks his ventilation control on. When Kirk calls battle stations, the ensign bolts for the bridge asking for permission to return to post, but doesn't get an answer. It's all a bit of bizarre bit of business, as next time we see him, he's back sulking in his quarters, but it has to happen for reasons of plot. They fire phasers and photons at the cloud to no avail, and then it enters through the impulse vent that got knocked loose when they were chasing it. Scotty reports that they have two hours of air, thanks to the creature being in the ventilation system. More crew have died, and McCoy loses his smeg with Kirk for pursuing it. He really does get cross. Yeah. Spock points out that it's all academic. The creature is now a real threat, and he recognises the fact that it turned and attacked them, so therefore must be conscious, thereby justifying Kirk's actions to an extent. Kirk orders Scotty to flush radioactive waste into the ventilation system. That can't be a good idea, surely. No. They're going to be breathing rounds for weeks oh. to come. McCoy apologises, but Kirk has still been behaving rudely and obsessively, as far as I'm concerned. Spock points out the captain's seeming in action on the Farragut would have made no difference given the creature's reactions. He says something about it sort of moving faster than time or some such weirdness. It does, it's, it's a time displacement, so I'm yeah. guessing that the pause is it's doing something with time, possibly as a defence mechanism. Mm, it's all moving faster than time or something weird. Or, or possibly moving faster than the human perception of time mm. rather than necessarily faster than time itself. So that it seems like there's a pause, except kind of there isn't. 
Mm. It's like a displacement thing going on. That's the that's the best explanation I can think of, given that you get lots of freezes as it gets up close. So that's my... Whereas towards the very end, there is a little bit more distance. I don't know. I'm not... Maybe. It doesn't really work, does it? Never no, mind. it's a bit odd. Spock goes to reassure Garavik that it wasn't his fault, which is something Kirk should be doing. Yeah. Very sweet of Spock, though. Just as well he did as he smells the gas creature entering through the air vent. Do you smell something? Probably our dog, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. So what stopped the radiation escaping then? Well, let's, let's not look into that. In a less than logical move, Spock tries to stop the creature pouring through the vent with his hands. Because that oh. was going to work, wasn't it? Well, it sort of does. He's, work, he's working on a hunch, except he wouldn't admit that, on the basis that his blood is made up of something different. Well, he he's, he's all right in thinking it's not going to affect him because it doesn't. But it's the fact that he thinks he can stop smoke with his hands. That, that doesn't work. No. <laughs> well, no, it's supposed to be that he's attracting, that he's effectively poisoning the cr- creature, or at least giving it a bad taste because it will be attracted initially. Well, what solves the problem isn't Spock, it's Scotty reversing the cabin yeah. pressure and, and effectively reversing the film as well. Because that, that's the, what happens. Yeah, yes. blatantly reversing the polarity of the neutron flow. Kirk asks Spock why he's not dead, and McCoy points out his green blood is made up of copper, not iron, so he's resistant to the creature. Apparently, the radiation is affecting it. Uh, let's hope it's not affecting the crew as well. Yeah, you don't see any evidence that it is, though. No. We get the reason why Garavik had to go to the bridge just to be ignored, so he could give Kirk his appraisal of the creature's battle tactics earlier. Kirk finally points out that the ensign's delay in firing made no difference then, or with Kirk 11 years ago. It's not quite an apology, but it does the trick for Garavik anyway. Kirk has worked out where it's going by vague mind contact with it or something... It's headed for its home in the Tycho star system where the Farragut was attacked. He at least does the right thing by informing Starfleet of what they're doing anyway. Yes. Spock has somehow worked out that it's gone home to reproduce. There's an awful lot of intuition going on here and you don't expect it from Spock. Kirk suggests using antimatter to destroy it, which is a slight improvement on nuclear waste, if no less destructive, as they point out. <laughs> they're going to use some of the ship's blood supply as bait. Spot points out that he should be the one going down to the planet as he's immune to the creature, but of course, Kirk can't allow that because he needs to be the hero every week. Yeah. Although he is at least taking Garavik with him because he can't hold the antimatter pod on his own. Oh, it's, it's all very sort of vengeance, isn't it? Mm. They beam down with a cool floating containment device. I like it. It's not! It. It's a fucking beach ball with shit stuck on it. I it looks it. bloody awful. Yeah, presumably it's on wires to make it look like it's floating, but you can't see the wires. That's quite good. I suppose. Creature takes the bait, leaving only them, and Kirk orders him Garavik back to the ship, but the ensign starts to fight to keep the captain from sending him back. Kirk then gets them both beamed up at the last moment, detonating the antimatter. Spock struggles to get them out of the transport, although there's no tension, as you know, they'll make it. Yeah. Thank God, McCoy says. Thank me, Spock replies. (laughs) They set off to rendezvous with the Yorktown, and Kirk promises Garavik several tall stories about his late father, which is nice and far better than the usual awful joke we get. And in the remastered version, as they fly off, we see a massive crater on Tycho 4, which is a nice touch because there's been an awfully big antimatter explosion. And that's our episode. Is it classic or is it just toss? Well, it has two problems, I think. The creature is just a generic baddie monster. Most of the time, Trek avoids that cliche. And the second problem is that in order to add tension and stretch things out, Kirk has to behave a bit of an arse for the first half. Which isn't a good look. I mean, all right, they're supposed to be doing the old... He's obsessed, therefore he's acting out a character, but... Yeah. And it's not the worst we've seen him be in the original series either, so I guess that's OK, but... Yeah. Well, it's I all think, right. I think it's supposed to be a bit Moby Dick. Yes. We're going down that road, aren't we? But he's he's clearly not that mad. No. I think... I like the idea of a gaseous creature that's really very different. To, yeah. yeah, that that for me is very much a good thing. I also like the idea that because it's so different, it's difficult for anyone who has encountered it to be by be believed by someone who hasn't. I think that's realistic. Yeah, but usually the way these things work out in Trek is it then the creature turns out to be just protecting its young, or uh, they didn't even question any of that. Exactly, they just killed them. It but just then, seemed... if there isn't a way to communicate with it more yeah. effectively, yeah, but normally. You know, they would make something. an effort to actually do that, wouldn't they? Yeah. So that it's it just seems like a baddie of the week as a result. It's got no great motivation. It's just going to kill some people and then go home and breed, basically. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with that so much. Where I have a problem is more 
eventually when Spock and McCoy turn to Kirk and they say, look, you're behaving out of character, we're genuinely worried, we're quoting the regs, give us some answers. So then he does and sounds more reasonable. It's yeah. like, why the fuck did you not say that before? Exactly, yes. That is one of the main things I find frustrating. Yeah, it's sort of that the episode turns a corner at that point. He, he doesn't seem so mad. But up until that point, he's just stupidly obsessed. And he could explain himself he at could. any point. He could. He just doesn't. So no. it's like, oh. I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that. And I think the other thing that annoys me is this freezing thing type what i mean there needs to be a better re- explanation than some kind of time displacement shit that then doesn't i mean work literally could, the they end. could discover that somehow the creature just you know freezes you in the spot some yeah. medusa like sort of thing before then striking which would be far better than it jumps through time or something yeah it weird mm. uh, it, very weird so I, I don't like that i think they'd be better off having a better explanation or it just being i don't know it yeah, just any better explanation than what they get, really. So mostly I like this because it's the it would have been pioneering something like this, the mm-hmm. idea that there's a gaseous far alien. <laughs> and I, I that's the sort of thing that I find really interesting. Mm-hmm. But it's not... It's, I, a, it's a fresh idea. Well, it's not a fresh spell, no. but, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, I don't think it's the acting, actually. I think, for me, it's the writing of yes. the, fir- the first part where Kirk is not... I mean, there are giving... moments when Shatner's a bit hammy, but, I mean... It's not too he, bad. He's c- compared to how he ha- can be yeah, in some episodes. Yeah, I think he's not... I think he's appreciating having centre stage a lot in this one. Yeah, so for me, it's the, it's the way that Kirk is written, hmm. because he should be... He is clearly capable of explaining himself to his senior officers, and I get that he shouldn't have to explain himself to everybody. no. But, but he needs to explain himself a bit more than he did. At, at least to Spock as his second yeah. in command, if no one else, mm-hmm. to his number one. Yep. And it pisses me off that he doesn't. Yeah. So, mostly classic. Then. I would say so, yeah. Fair Flawed enough. classic. Yeah, OK. That's what, that's what I would say. But what does Jeff think? He says, I really enjoyed this episode. It has a fun B-movie sci-fi monster feel and there's a great interaction between the big three. Kirk's Ahab-esque behaviour shows some pretty good character continuity, considering Conscious of the King and the pursuit of the Gorn in Arena. That's true. Yeah, good point. The biggest drawbacks being a dry ice vapour from a fog machine that isn't that threatening, and they jump straight to killing the creature rather than mm. attempting communication or containment. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, the big problem. That's, a, that's another biggie. Boss has this to say. I'm sure it's already been mentioned, but this episode is clearly Moby Dick. Yes, it has been. With the whale substituted for a sparkly gla- gas cloud. The episode gets going straight away with the threat established and three red shirt deaths before the opening credits. Despite being given only one instruction by Kirk, the ensign fails to shoot the creature when it gets its chance. It's then decided that despite already losing three crew members, they should go down to the planet again to lose some more. This time, one of the ensigns is given a backstory, which left me convinced that he was going to die tragically by the end of the episode. Yeah, Quinn at one point when he's dead. Yeah. <laughs> he also fails to shoot when given the opportunity. Well, this is all explained vaguely. <laughs> yeah. This brings me to my first issue with an otherwise decent episode. Both Kirk and Ensign Garavik's guilt comes from them not shooting the creature when they had a chance. But why did anybody think it would have made a difference? It's just a cloud of gas with nothing solid to hit. I know they gave an explanation of it changing states, but it was no surprise when the phasers and torpedoes fired from the Enterprise did nothing and they finally twigged. A better creature design would have greatly helped the episode. My other issue is that the plot device of having to get vaccines to a planet within a short time frame was incredibly similar to one we saw only a few episodes ago. Was it? So you said that was the first time... I thought it was. Now, which one's that then? Mm. That would be why I was thinking deja vu then and trope. because I was thinking that happens a lot in Next Gen. It does, but I I think Bosch is right. I think it's happened before in the original series. On a positive side, I really enjoyed the interactions between the crew and particularly between Kirk, McCoy and Spock. I was disappointed that Scotty didn't say, if I give it any more, it'll blow. I was also pleasantly surprised that Ensign Garavik didn't die, which yeah. led to a decent and thankfully non-jokey ending. It was also free of the unpleasant moments that marred recent episodes. Yes. Yay! Yes. Rapey free! Huzzah! Yeah. Overall, it was a well-paced Monster of the Week episode that managed to keep my attention to the end. Yeah. yeah. yeah fair enough. Yeah. Was it one of the ones with one of the Commodores that they were trying to, they had to get the ship, and it was the idiot put it through the neutral zone? In order to get there. Oh, I can't remember. Yes, I think that's it. I'm not sure if it was for a vaccine. What did Sampo and Yona make of this? Um, hello. Hello. So we just watched Obsession. What happened in it? <laughs> Kirk was a dick and blew up a planet. 
or as I saw it, he had a massive flu and he just wanted to go to bed. Yeah, he was a, was a bit grumpy. I don't think Shatner has the sort of acting chops to do driven or obsessive and he just seemed like a dick. <laughs> Uh, no, his his voice sounded like he would have flu, and then he was sweaty all the time. <laughs> yeah. So I thought he might be sick. I guess that's just obsessive shacking 101. Put some sweat beads and sound like you're sick or something. <sighs> yeah. Quite a coincidence that the son of the <clears throat> captain was on board just when they met this thing again. You mean the Kirk's fever? <laughs> fever dream, yeah, that's the one. <gasps> see, I see they're running out of budget now that the monster of the week was just some gas that someone's either scratching on the film or pushing from a fire extinguisher behind some rocks. Uh... <sighs> but I don't... I mean, there really was no reason for Kirk to be so obsessive. I mean, once Spock and McCoy cornered him and made him answer the questions, he explained the whole thing reasonably. I mean, if he'd started with that... But he was using his privilege as captain to behave like... What was the word he used? Uh, intuition. Intu- yeah, with, yeah. I mean, what, what kind of a stupid rule is it? I, I guess it's just his fever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no one wants to say, okay, Captain, actually there is no such rule that Captain can just use the intuition that overrides the rules yeah. or logic. A bit like when he said to Scotty, that, how about we put some radiation into the air ducts, that will work. And Scotty was like, like I and left off. I mean, where's the harm in putting some radiation in the air ducts? Yeah. Just obey. When the thing was coming out of the vent in the guy's room, I can't remember, and Spock put his hand over the vent. I mean, I thought, I thought that, okay, that looks stupid. I mean, there's no way that that stops the creature from coming through. Uh, no, it actually didn't. But I actually thought it was trying to mind meld with it, and I thought, okay, that looks ridiculous, but there's actually a point there. But no, Spock was just trying to stop the creature from coming in by putting his hand over the much bigger vent. But he tasted bad. Uh, yeah, that's true. Of copper. Yeah. Luckily, on the bridge, there was the one button that they had to press, which re- reversed yeah, the yeah, <laughs> airflow. Yeah, nice to have that button. Yeah. The story doesn't tell how many people mm. di- died because... They're uh, not important. Because they didn't take the vaccine to the Yorktown or something like that. Yeah, because they had Kirk's fever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes I think, why why does he care so much in some things? And then again, he doesn't care yeah. other things <clears throat> at all. I mean, entire populations of planets have died and he's just shrugged that off. And uh, yeah, well, um, uh, it, I guess it was this episode tried handling trauma, but didn't do it very well. So yeah, I mean, you, you found the episode quite boring and... Th- yeah, it was hard to watch Kirk being so sick. <laughs> and I mean, I think I had more fun what- <laughs> watching you get annoyed at the episode <laughs> than watching the episode itself. I mean, yeah, very, it's a, an art form that I perform. Very, very beige episode. Uh, I mean, it was so slow, but mm. well, then again, he was sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's hope for more excitement next week then, I guess. Maybe he's cured mm. by then. Maybe. I mean, like, ten people died in this episode, and yet it was quite boring. Or maybe when they had this at the end, it <laughs> sounded like seducing from uh, from Kirk's side. He's like, let's go to my quarters. <laughs> and I will talk to you about your... <laughs> <laughs> Father, about <laughs> I'll I'll tell you some tall tales. <laughs> uh, well, now that we've killed together and and had some fisty cups together, now and now we can go and spend time together like men and share stories. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. Until next time. Bye. 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 <laughs> yeah, I thought that Shatner had a cold or something. All right. Like, does that mean that the actor had a cold and it's completely coincidental? Are they trying to make a thing of it and that he's he is feverish? Or I don't think so. Yeah.
The edge Maybe had the edge had a cold. Fair mm. enough. Fair enough. And Nimoy had one the other week, so possibly he's caught Nimoy's cold. Oh, yeah. Could be. Could be. And you're right, it is a bit of a coincidence yeah. that Garavik, yeah, yeah, Junior. Junior. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, the uh, the intuition rule is clearly stupid. Oh, it's bollocks. Would not it? stand up in court, no. I'm afraid. Oh, yeah, I, I blew the plant up. Intuition. There was something bad there. Um, yeah. <laughs> And yes, the radiation enema was not oh, a good idea. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. Thanks, guys. Thank you. We hear from the Llama God. Longest log, Scotty, Fixie Tree, Noi, Fixie Keurig. Tell them the honey, mummy. Now, this is an episode with a big problem, one very big problem, and that is the uniform deltas. Um, is it just me noticing that? But it seems like for some of the cast, the insignias on their uniforms are all over the place. Kirk seems too low down, Chapels is balancing right on the top of her very low cut collar. Is, 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 what's going on? What's going on? Was there a problem with the costume department this week? I guess not everyone is obsessed with costumes as I am. Do you see what I did there? Do you do? Anyway, anyway, this is actually a pretty good episode. It's a really good story for the most part. It's obviously a tale of, can you guess what? And it really plays with the subject quite nicely with Kirk trying to basically assuage his guilt from what he perceived to be earlier failings which led to the deaths of quite a lot of people on the ship. Well, that does bring the question of where in the Strange New Worlds timeline does this come because he's referred to as only being a lieutenant there whereas I think he's promoted by the time we see him so I don't know is that yet to come? Who cares that's for Strange New Worlds. Let's go back to this episode. And yeah it's also a good take on the fact that there's this obviously dangerous cloud creature and there's the things to do with medical supplies there's the toss up there it's the old argument needs of the many etc etc although destroying the cloud could be saving even more people so yeah it's quite a good story quite a good moral dilemma and I like that we get to see some nice tensions between Kirk and the others and possibly we get to see that Starfleet has learned things since previous episodes like say the Doomsday Machine because there were actually protocols to relieve captains who were unfit of command that would have been useful I'm sure in a couple of previous episodes but here we are better late than never I guess and yeah Shatner actually for the most part apart from a couple of occasions where he overacts at Chekhov and a couple of other points but for the most part Shatner does a pretty good job in this episode as a Kirk who is yes obsessed I'm going to keep using that word aren't I but he is obsessed but you do get the idea that at the same time he knows he's not entirely in the right so yeah it's quite a good performance there in the most part we get to see a nice little extra side to Chapel as well which is really good to see which brings her a little bit closer a very tiny bit closer to her Strange New World representation where she has to trick Gary into eating with a little ruse and as ever there's some great stuff with Spock and McCoy as they try and figure out what's wrong with Kirk and especially the exchange when Spock goes to McCoy I need your advice and McCoy's reply then I need a drink so yes that's great there is some really good stuff here like a lot of tension a lot of dilemma and it's really well done but the big question of course for the episode is why do they destroy the creature why don't they study it further yeah I mean obviously it's dangerous but their immediate reaction is to rather than study this new life form that they're you know one of these new life forms they're actually sent to seek out they just bomb it basically I mean yes it is clearly dangerous but they could have studied it figured out why it's feeding like that there's a whole range of things this is really quite a shallow look at things and it is a very humanoid life form or at least federation centric view of what life is important so yeah a bit disappointing on that front but apart from that the drama is pretty good to this episode pretty solid and also surprisingly on Netflix we're treated to the original edition I don't know if that's just my Netflix being weird but yeah there weren't any special edition CGI effect upgrades on this one which to be fair the episode didn't really seem to need because the drama was strong enough on its own so yeah that's fair so yeah so yeah not a bad episode I didn't mind this one at all so yeah as ever then I'll be looking forward to finding out what everyone else made of this I hope no one was looking forward to getting anywhere fast and until next time glory to you and your cast thank you you. glad you enjoyed it as well not just me the uh, Paramount Plus has the uh, the remastered edition so that was the first one I saw So it's interesting that uh, Netflix has the original on that one. Mm. It sounds... I mean, I've not seen the remastered because we watch it on DVD, but it sounds as though the DVD version is better. It is, yes, in this case. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, it's a better Shatner performance this week, I think. Yeah, And those were nice chapel scenes and the Spock and McCoy one was very good. I loved it. Yes. I need your advice, then I need a drink. Yes. (laughs) What did Drew and Tracy make of this? So we just watched Obsession... Yes. And what did we think of that one then? Well, I thought it was a great episode of Star Trek. I've just written down, if you say it's a classic, <laughs> we're going to be having words. It say is, it. it is I a, dare it you. I fucking a, double dare you to 100% say it. 100% classic. 100%. Get lost. Okay. So free red shirts. Yep. Beam down. At the beginning, yes. Free red shirts. In the shirts. teaser, yep. three red shirts, beam down. Yep. We're instantly like... Yeah, you're going to get song. it. Yep. You're all going to get it. And they did. We knew oh, they were going to bop yeah. it. And, and plus... Well, no, Shat- three, because he uh, did yeah, eventually yeah. die, didn't he? Yeah, Everyone. he did. Plus Shatner is just... Shatner in 
it all. You kept through. saying that. He does, he does it every sentence. But like, he was for just about very the first dramatic. 15 minutes, though. This is a classic episode oh. of Star Trek because God. it's got all the all the classic things. It's got the red shirt dying. It's got Shatner in, Shatner in it up. That's why I think it's a classic. We really need to have a conversation. Plus, <laughs> other stuff is got. It's a, the Enterprise has got to de- deliver perishable vaccines. It's always fucking doing perishable vaccines, yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't it? Well, that's all they do. Shush, Alexa. Alexa, off. It's always doing. It's always doing perishable vaccines, isn't it? What? Why? It's either that or diplomats. It's all they do. Who? The Enterprise. Oh, <laughs> oh so Dicaronium. <laughs> That's yeah. a fucking name and a half, isn't it? Dichronium was it? Is that I what it is? Yeah, I think Dichronium. it's dichronium. It's got two, two uh, atom, two molecules, oh, isn't right. it? So dichronium is the one. Dichronium is the the element. 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 Yeah. Yes. Where does that come from? It's made up. Made up. up yeah. Made up. Em. <laughs> I think it is, isn't it? <laughs> On the uh, periodic table. So let's talk about the new security officer. Yes. Comes onto the bridge. Garavik. I was like, oh, hello. I know. Even yeah, you were like, like, ooh. He's a bit of a look, you? aren't he? And then there's like an allusion to who his dad is. Yes. And we were like, who? Who is it? Who is it? I didn't mention it. Yeah. And then we understand that obviously his dad Captain was Kirk's. Captain Garavik yeah, and when he, yeah. Kirky's boss. But Kirk is really mad in this episode. He's yes, so he is. He attitude-y. Is. He is, yeah. You know, and... and it takes a long time to kind of unravel the story till you understand mm-hmm. that. Yeah. You say, what the fuck is wrong with him? He's just yes. got some out of his ass tonight, but... Yep. I get it now. McCoy's fingernails when Spock passed in the thing and you get a close-up of the hands. You <laughs> did say, what is... I, I can't don't... believe how a doctor should not have your fingernails that long. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing he's the only gynecologist on the ship. <laughs> and he's doing... <laughs> A lot of prostate exams. I'd be like, please cut your fingernails, mate, before you go near me. <laughs> I have no words. Space fog. Space fog, yeah. The, the, Space fog. The episode, the, this is not remastered on Netflix. No, it we really isn't. That. No, it's yeah, it not. was terribly, yeah. like, the graphics were mm. very bad, weren't That's they? That's just what made it such a classic episode. Yeah. Anyway, Scotty says the cloud is going for a number two and it yes. needs to be flushed. Yep. That was the best line I've it heard was, in this yeah. whole episode. I liked when um, McCoy and Spock go to like the uh, go to Captain Kirk's quarters and like, they're all debating, is this a good bit of Sartic? But the, the bit that made us laugh was when uh, McCoy says, you know, I'm going to need a command decision. And he walks towards the door and the door opens and Spock in walks in. Was, Spock. Uh, was McCoy going, look, look, look I'm going to say this. Still just stand outside and when I go, I'm going to need a command decision. Walk in, it'll look so good. No, yeah, Spock was outside with a glass of the door yeah, and he heard him say it. So they the glass, said it out. Did. Yeah, of course they did. It's Get good, away. it's a good bit. I like the parallel between Kirk and Garavik where he's, you know, he's saying you didn't you didn't make a bad decision. Yeah. Because the same thing that Kirk did. Yes. Which is why I think this is a classic episode. I'm sorry. I loved it. I thought it's great. Kirk obsessed. Sp- Spock and McCoy debating it. The whole lot is good. For fuck's sake. I think it's great. Anyway. Really we... like this episode. Yes, yeah, all right. <laughs> Shall we leave it there? Okay, okay. See you later, guys. Bye. 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 Yeah. Now I'm with Drew. Yeah, I, I really, en- yeah. I really enjoyed this episode. It's not without its flaws, but mm. I did really enjoy it. In terms of was Spock primed, I thought so. I don't <laughs> think though that he needed a glass to the door because don't Vulcans have superior hearing? Yeah, those ears, you see, those yeah. ears, and he knows how to make a dramatic entry, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he does. <laughs> I did speaking not of... notice McCoy's fingernails. Did you? Yeah, I was going to, speaking of which, I, I believe Doctor Mbenga does all the rectal examinations, so. That salts that one out. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps his nails nice and short. Yeah, there we are. We've got a cat and Alexa on that one. Blimey, it's a cast of thousands when they feed yeah. back these days. <laughs> Actually, when you say, Drew, Shatner is Shatner, Shatnering, I don't think we saw much Shacting. I mean, there were, as he said, the, the, the scene with Chekhov wasn't so good. But one or two scenes where he was OTT. But mostly I thought he was all but right. But given how bad he often is, this was actually quite good. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>
Right, let's finish with the Puri. And is he hiding under a desk? I don't know. I don't think so. Hello, Args. Puri here to talk about Obsession, a fragrance by Calvin Klein. Um, yeah, this one, uh, I don't know, maybe it was watching it in a hotel rather than on my big telly or something. But no, I wasn't feeling this one. Um, it's got some good bits. I think actually probably the middle bit of the episode's probably the best when they actually uh, are kind of on the ship and uh, you do have, you know, again, the big, big tension of this is Kirk is acting way out. There's some vaccines that need delivered and uh, but he's seemingly obsessed with something on this planet. And of course it turns out to be a creature that uh, killed uh, his crew and his captain. Uh, way back when he was a lieutenant in the Farragut. Um, and that captain's son happens to be on the Enterprise, but not really much goes on with that, really. You know, he's just sort of there and is almost there just for the fist fight at the end. I mean, he's really... He's there to go into a big huff in his room when he gets confined to quarters uh, to have a, a cute but rather pointless scene with Chapel. And uh, then, um, like I say, get into a dust-up with Kirk at the end. Um, although I did kind of like the idea that Kirk was very much in the, no, I'm not sacrificing my life, you idiot. You know, he was going in for the, I'll do the noble sacrifice, and Kirk's like, no, I'm, I'm planning to survive this, which is a nice twist in that, because usually you have the, you know, the full expecting thing is, I'll sacrifice myself. But, you know, Kirk goes, you, you've been back to the ship, gets thunked on the back of the head, and he goes and dies in the cloud, um, which he didn't. And the creature itself is quite good. It's the thing I like about TOS. For all, it was mainly dry ice and smoke played backwards or forwards, and a big hazy thing. Um, it's one of those things I like about TOS, um, where there are these big, terrifying things, and it was that thing that Spock was saying, that it was going to potentially multiply and turn into lots of clouds that would you know, drift through the galaxy, killing people. And it's almost like there's like apocalyptic stuff that just, you know, because that, you know, potentially apocalyptic stuff that just suddenly pops up in the galaxy. And it's literally dealt with in an episode. We'll see a similar thing in an episode called the Immunity Syndrome. Um, and I do like the fact that space is dangerous, but also that, uh, you know, I mean, not to dis Discovery, but uh, it took them a season to wipe out an apocalyptic, you know, crisis, whereas, uh, you know, Kirk and Co. can do it in 45 minutes. Um, it's just, like I say, they almost treated apocalyptically. <laughs> I think they liked using apocalyptic up the stakes for an episode, but they didn't have any continuity, so. It is that kind of weird thing where you do get, like I say, something which is, it's got to be apocalyptic, otherwise Kirk's behaviour is um, unacceptable. You know, if, he, if you just leave this thing on the planet and naff off, it's, you know, just put a boy around the planet saying don't come here, but uh, no matter how much uh, titanium it's got on it. But uh, instead, you know, he's wanting to hunt this creature and uh, face down his own fears. And like I say, there's a nice scene between Spock and McCoy. Um, potentially relieving your duty. So there's that. I just felt it meandered, particularly around the the start and end. Um, it meandered far too much. I just didn't find, you know, it just wasn't doing anything. It was Kirk acting weird and everyone going, hmm, Kirk's acting weird and uh, massacring lots of red shirts. I mean, you know, again, at the end of this, we're down, what, about six red shirts, is it? It's quite a lot. It's, you know, they really ploughed through them in this one. You know, again, it wasn't really a trope in season one, but it is now. But uh, yeah, the only other thing I thought about this was, I wonder if this has happened in Where We Are in Strange New Worlds. Not this episode, but the original encounter with the Farragut and um, the Cloud Creature. And, uh, you know, is the captain now the person who was the first officer? Or has it not happened yet? And that kind of explains how Kirk's a bit different. Um, probably something they'll not see fit to explain because it's just weird fans like me who are interested in that. So, uh, anyways, that. But yeah, overall, this one, I maybe wasn't fully focused on it. Maybe it was me, but I'll be interested to see what everyone else thinks. So, all that remains to be say, do keep up the good work. I always look forward to the podcast, and I'll feedback at the next one. But until then, bye for now. Bye. 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 You're right. I did think that Garavik went and had a big huff in his room. That's very much the way I read it. Yeah, I liked the fact that Kirk was planning to survive, which is a little bit different than the, oh, no, I must sacrifice myself. And Garavik is a red shirt and survives. Yep, yep, uh, it's five in the end, not six, but yeah. Yeah, you're right, there's a lot of red shirt deaths, but it's, it, it's good that there is one that survives. I, I like the Garavik stuff. I thought he reacted quite well, better than Kirk, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, but then... Arguably, Kirk has been carrying this around for 11 years mm. and it's only just happened to Garavik. True enough, true enough, yep, yep. 
And uh, yeah, that, I like that was, uh, the original series, The Galaxy is a Dangerous Place, is true. Possibly at its most dangerous compared to later series in chronology anyway. <laughs> because well, by, the, by the time of next generation, they've got such super high tech that actually it takes a lot more to threaten them. And, but isn't that actually the point that Q makes? That, yeah. And that's why he introduces them to the Borg really yes. early, to shake them up and say, no, you're... There is still dangerous stuff yeah. out there, yeah, yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, he mentioned the immunity syndrome. Guess what we're covering next? Is it the immunity syndrome? How did you guess? Wow. <laughs> and we're recording on Thursday, the 12th of October. So we'll catch you then. Take care. Cheerio, bye. Bye, bye. The Star Trek theme was written by Alexander Courage and here was arranged and performed by Drew Barker. The artwork was created by Andy Pelastides. All music referenced is for illustrative purposes only and no copyright infringement is intended. Find our website at broadcast.libsyn.com And we have a YouTube channel as well. Send emails or mp3s to broadcast at gmail.com Or you can find us over on Mastodon. Our addresses are on the show notes for this podcast. Shut it down!